I will be your facilitator tonight. My name is Matthew Rizzi, and I'm with the San Francisco LGBT Community Center. Um, tonight, we are joined by Sandra Gates Anderson from the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development, as well as A. Young Kim from Housing Economic Rights Advocate. Um, they will be presenting on the tools that you can use as part of your estate planning, as well as for those who already own the home uh, through the mayor's program or utilize the program, what the rules are that um, will need to be followed in order to make that happen. So um, before we get there, I do want to introduce who we are, um, Homeownership SF. So Homeownership SF is a citywide collaboration of experienced nonprofit housing counseling agency. Um, we serve as a centralized hub for agencies, um, as, a, as a centralized hub for agencies to provide local affordable housing to our community. Um, we connect renters, home buyers, homeowners with education. Um, we do so um, in, all throughout the city and those city, those agencies include not only the San Francisco LGBT Community Center, but it also includes Asian Inc, Mission Economic Development Agency, also known as META, San Francisco Housing Development Corporation, SFHDC, and Balance. Um, and so what we do is we, before the pandemic, we would be located all over the city to make it as convenient for all of you to access as possible. Um, what we do is, as part of the financial planning that you are all interested in tonight, what we can do as an agency for you all is take a look at your budget and see what makes sense as part of um, getting your financial plans together, what savings plan may need to exist. Take a look at how credit management may be a part of that. Take a look at the debt structure. And that way you're armed with some information by the time that we do refer you to resources that can support you with the tools to put that together. Now, estate planning is important, not only because what we're seeing now with a pandemic when emergency or catastrophe arises, but it's also important to have all of this in place. So that way, you know, you can take care to make sure that um, you are prepared in the future and you are able to preserve all of the hard work and the generational wealth that you have accumulated and put together for your family. Because, um, you know, just like in finance where we, learn by experience and nobody teaches us in school. It's an important topic that we need to learn, but you, with finances, we have some time to pick up and, and learn that information. But with estate planning, sometimes, you know, waiting until some major event happened might be a little too overwhelming for us to get through. So planning and getting this information is a great first step to uh, making sure that you can avoid the hassles and the cost that probate court may may thrust upon you if you don't have a plan in place. Um, once again, um, I'm going to leave this time to the experts that we have brought together for you all. So we have an attorney from um, Housing and Economic Rights Advocate, also known as Hera, here to present on some tools that you can use as part of that estate planning. And after A. Young Kim is done, then um, we will have Sandra Gates um, Anderson from the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development. And today I'll probably slip in to calling them MoCD for short. So um, with, without further ado, um, what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna reserve questions till the end of the presentation. So if questions do come up for you, please go ahead and write them down. And that way we can get through the presentation because they may be covered along the way. And, um, and that way, um, we can get through the presentation and the hour that we've set up here. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce attorney A. Young Kim from Hera. Thank you very much, Matthew. And hello, everyone. I'm A. Young Kim. And as Matthew introduced me, and I'm a staff attorney at Hera. So we will go over estate planning, pretty much estate planning basics, what document we are referring to and okay I decided to make one what we should do so let me share my um, presentation I don't have a long powerpoint so you're probably happy to hear that but uh, I know that you were all advised to watch the little clip before this uh, presentation so if you didn't have any chance that's okay we will repeat the same information a little bit more briefly but if you could go back to the 
a clip and it may be helpful because it has more information. Or if you would like to have the uh, workshop which he, uh, which he explained each document a little bit longer and a little bit more detail, you are welcome to join uh, another workshop which will be held uh, next week, next Thursday, I believe. So uh, Christine may provide some link that you can join. So estate planning, the word itself, give us very misconception because I, before my lawyer time, I thought the same thing too. Estate planning is for the rich and I don't really have any estate to plan. So it's, feel, I felt like it's far away, but think about it and we can uh, question ourselves. So especially this pandemic situation. So, okay, if I get COVID and then I, and if I suffer it's more severely than any other folks, what will happen to my kids? And they are only five or six. Will there be anyone who will provide the care for them? What about my mom who is in nursing home and I could not see her because of this uh, pandemic situation? And what about my bills and payment, the loan payment I have to pay to the city or my mortgages, pg and &E bills? What is it that what will happen? So knowing what will happen, or giving some instruction that you want to see happen. That's the estate planning indeed. It's not just about the how am I gonna save all the taxes and how I can reserve all the wealth that I uh, build up. Rather than that, we can just prepare for our lifetime for such as incapacity during my lifetime. And also after I'm gone, who will be in charge and what will happen to my stuff and my personal legacy. So writing down, put that one in writing and give some clear instruction to my loved ones so they, at least they don't have to suffer about my stuff on top of their own sorrow and um, difficult time. So let's talk about the incapacity first because oftentimes we ignore because we are perfectly fine and have relatively sound mind at this time. But I know this pandemic hit a lot of us and gave us chance to think about what if, what if. So in California, we will see if there any individual really lost their capacity, incapacitated because of physical limit or most likely mental incapacity. They will look at it, is, has this person, has this a young Kim made any type of document generally called power of attorney, medical power of attorney or healthcare directive? Did she ever made this document? And if answer is yes, it will likely the named person as an agent will be able to make my personal care decision or um, medical determination if I cannot do so, such as if I became coma for two weeks and three weeks or even day or two. And doctors are saying there is really, really no chance for me to get better soon. And can they pull my, um, because I don't wanna live on life support. And if that was my personal choice, can my a, a, my I'm sorry, my agent can make that decision for me under the terms of my medical power of attorney, healthcare directive. If I didn't have that such type of paperwork, probably my loved ones and my friend, my sister, and they need to go to probate court to get the conservatorship over person. So there is a proceeding conservatorship. And then as I'm telling you the conservatorship is the most daunting procedure among other probate court procedure because you can imagine that's gonna be last resort that any individual will land. Another document is um, we hear a lot is durable power of attorney or power of attorney regarding property management. So same thing, if a young game in, is incapacitated and doctors are saying a young cannot handle her own and someone else's financial matters, and what will happen? Who will be in charge of my stuff and my asset and my property? And if I had made any power of attorney document, the named agent or power, 
uh, attorney, in fact, will be able to handle my financial matters as I give the direction in the document. And then my agent doesn't have to go to probate court because I already gave the direction in my power of attorney document. If I didn't have such a document, my family member or my friend will have to go to probate and get the conservatorship of his state. With that authority, my conservator will be able to handle my financial matters, but every single action pretty much need to go to court and get some permission from the court. So it's very long and exhausting and expensive procedure. So I just wanted to point out power of attorney is very good document and useful during my lifetime. However, sometimes it's confusing because there are so many different uh, names of power of attorney. If you look at the left side, let's see today is a signing date. And sometimes I just put POA, but that stands for power of attorney. So regular power of attorney gives a power to my agent to be able to act on behalf of me from the moment of signing. And this uh, black arrow dot is the, when my pay, whether my a agent has a power to act or not. So from the moment my agent can act on behalf of me. And then if I ever become incapacitated, my agent cannot act anymore because regular power of attorney is valid from the moment of signing and then it cannot survive my incapacity. And another form you probably have seen a lot is durable power of attorney. That's the same function. My agent can act on behalf of me from the moment that I'm signing. And then my agent can act even if my doctors are saying that Aeon cannot handle her own matters and someone else's matter. And then that doesn't stop my agent uh, from acting on behalf of me. So my agent can continue to act for me and then until uh, my passing. Hey Young, is there a slide we should be following? Um, you, you had mentioned an arrow. Oh, is that, do you see the black dot line here? I'm not seeing any slide. Is are any of the other facilitators seeing a slide? Do you see power of attorney? You know, I can't see it either, Aeyoung. Do you mind trying to unshare and, and reshare your screen again? Oh, so sure, sorry I'm sorry. What, were you able to share, uh, see previous one? No. Um, you haven't seen so a maybe, slide, any slide yet. Maybe go ahead and try it right now. Okay. So you haven't seen any slide? There, no, there we go, there we go. Oh. So sorry about that. No, I, oh, that's, that's okay. Confused. Yeah, so now can you see? Yes. Perfect. Okay, thanks for uh, pointing that one out. So let's just go back. So this, I didn't have many slides, so nothing to worry uh, about. But this was a slide, if we are incapacitated, if we have a power of attorney, and then we don't have to go to probate court. If we didn't have any power of attorney document, you probably have to go to probate court to obtain a conservatorship. And the same situation regarding any of your finances or properties. So this was the slide that I was in, in power of attorney, POA, power of attorney, general power of attorney will be effective from the date that we are signing today. And here is black arrow that arrow <laughs> I was referring to. So that power of attorney is valid only until um, I am, on, only during my competency. So if doctors are saying I cannot act for myself and that general power of attorney died, it's, it's no longer valid. But durable power of attorney, same thing, I, my agent can act from the moment that I sign and then even if I lose my capacity, my agent can still act on behalf of me until my passing. And another term is a spring durable power of attorney. I hope you have seen uh, several times, spring durable power of attorney, you sign today, just like any other power of attorney. 
but there is no arrow, no line here. That means my agent cannot act, not, on, not from the moment that I sign. When will my agent will uh, act on behalf of, behalf of me? From the moment that you designated when my agent can act. Typically, for most of us, we will indicate the time is my agent, can, my agent authority will be effective if or if and only if I two doctors are saying that I cannot act for myself. And then my agent can act for me until the moment that I pass away. Please notice that your power of attorney dies when you die. Sometimes clients say, I'm a, an agent under my power of a, my mom's power of attorney, and we are trying to sell mom's house. And then they said, I cannot do it. And then I asked, how's your mom? And client said, oh, she passed away three years ago. And that was why, because when your mom passed away, your authority died at the same time. You cannot act for your deceased mom. So if you have a bank account, sometimes a big bank or credit union, they have their own power of attorney. So you can go and ask them if you would like to put an agent uh, in preparation of your capacity, make sure you can use the form, but see if they have any uh, checkbox or if the form gives any option. Because you're just signing any type of power of attorney, I think there's a high, higher chance that you are really uh, limiting or specifying when your agent can act on behalf of you. But now you are more familiar with this power of attorney terms. So when you are asked to sign any type of power of attorney, make sure you are uh, familiar with the time frame or the moment when your agent can act. So just again, the during left side is uh, the document that will be helpful during your lifetime. Healthcare directive, medical power of attorney, or financial power of attorney. And also you can set up a living trust. Living trust is valid and effective during my lifetime, only for my benefit. I am just generalizing uh, what living trust is made for. If I make my own living trust and I can revoke, I can amend, I can make any changes during my lifetime. And any asset coming into my trust is just I'm the only one who will get benefit from it. But when I pass away, right side is a document that we use um, to wrap up this decedent affairs. And will if we are familiar with the will. There's a do written document indicating who gets what, who will be responsible, and if there is any other direction. And trust is also valid after I pass away. So my next person in line, uh, so to speak, successor trustee will be able to manage and administer my trust assets in the way that I gave the direction. Only difference is um, trust is still valid after my passing, but it became irrevocable. No one can change my, any provision of trust. So let's think about what will happen um, in California when someone died. So we will, um, not every asset will need to go to probate court. Probate court is type of court that you have to take it um, to. Just if you are getting divorced, you go to family court. If you get a traffic ticket, you go to traffic court. If someone passed away, that person's affairs need to be wrapped up and then any surviving person will go to probate court. So let's say a young girl passed away. She happened to have five houses in the Bay Area. I wish, disclaimer, I don't have any, any of those. So if you have a house in living trust, so title is actually held as a young Kim, as trustee of a young Kim's revocable trust, those houses are not subject to probate court proceeding. Successor trustee can take the house and manage the house and distribute the houses to the named beneficiary. And beneficiary designated. If you have any brokerage account, 
checking and savings, retirement. If you have named any beneficiary, primary, even secondary, and then the named beneficiary will contact the bank and show the present my death certificate. If I'm the bank account holder, they just need to present my death certificate and the person's ID. If I ha had named um, my mom as my beneficiary, my mom could go to bank and telling them I passed away and the bank will just all out the balance check to her. So that named beneficiary account is not subject to probate. Another one, joint ownership. If I own a property with John Doe as joint tenants, that means if either of you, either of us passes away, the surviving person will take the 100% ownership by just simply filing one affidavit. So that asset, if it's owned by joint tenants, and that doesn't have to go to probate court. If the house is owned by two or multiple owner as tenant in common, that's the actual term that you can find from the deed. And then my portion will have will be subject to probate while the other owner's portion is not uh, subject to probate because that's the, the interest owned by the other owner. Transfer and death deed is a new, new mechanism to make the transfer really simple. California started um, allowing it, having just to avoid any like co cost. Um, it's because setting up living trust takes some time and expensive. So California said, okay, if you are sure about the benefit of this farm, you can simply say, A young Gim, I'm the owner of this house. When I pass, pass away, I would like to leave this house to George Clooney and Brad Pitt. And then I pass away. It doesn't happen anything until I actually die. And George Clooney, George and Brad learn that they are the beneficiary of this my house. And they can just file a simple affidavit saying A Young Kim was the owner, she passed away, here's her death certificate, we are the new owner, and they will become the new owner. However, downfall is what if George Clooney and Brad Pitt died before me? So, and then that asset doesn't have any named beneficiary, so that will become the subject of probate. Or, oh, I, Sell, I sold the house right before I pass away and I purchased another home in San Diego and it doesn't go with a homeowner. Once I sold the property and the transfer and death deed I had, it becomes null because I'm no longer the owner. So my San Diego new house will become uh, subject to probate. So to decide whether this is decedent estate will be subject to probate court proceeding or not, we will look at it. What's the, excuse me, what is the total value of this decedent estate? And if it's more than $166,250, and it will become the, it, it will become subject to probate. We don't count the net value or e equity. We will calculate based on the market value. So if you are a homeowner in San Francisco, I can guarantee even if it's really tiny and small and looks like really not that great, I betcha it will go way over than $166,250. So to avoid probate, I think the best way to consider is just put your house into your living trust meaning that make a living trust document and deed the house to your living trust. And what's the living trust? It's like a series of your own instruction book, manual. Of course, it will have to have certain languages and cite the law, but basically you indicate who will be the beneficiary when I pass away. And if the first beneficiary Fail to predecease, uh, fail to survive me, where does it need to go? And you can accommodate with um, each beneficiary. If beneficiaries are minors, 
at the time of your making it, you can indicate it needs to go to which adult uh, custodian adult or set up a child trust so that they don't have to get the guardianship of his state. Or so you can say who will be the person acting as the manager of this trust, successor trustee, first person, second person, and third person. And you can also during your lifetime, if you change your mind, if one of beneficiary or successor trustee nominated drives you crazy and you found that we, you don't share same philosophy or a management style, you can always change it. And make sure once you make a trust and if you would like to um, take advantage of having trust and you need to transfer most of your asset to your living trust but you won't uh, change title of your retirement because IRS will recognize it as a transaction. So you may end up getting penalty. Instead for retirement, you make sure uh, name any beneficiaries. So wills and trusts are different. It has a very similar information in who gets my stuff when I pass away, who will be in charge of wrapping up my affairs, but will still needs to go to probate court if all of the decedent asset is more than $166,250. And once will is filed at the court, it becomes public record. Anyone can go to probate court and look at the document. And nowadays, um, informations are available from online. If you pay a fee, you can look at the document itself. And will is only valid when you pass away. And also it's a subject to estate recovery. While trust is not subject to estate recovery, meaning when you become a medical recipient and then you don't, you're not required to pay back the expenses that the department pay. But when you pass away, your estate will be responsible for the reimbursement of the expenses. But the law got changed, I think from 2017, they can request reimbursement on the properties of the decedent, which is subject to probate. So if you own a home and it's in your individual name, but if you are getting medical benefit and then when you pass away, chances are they will request the reimbursement of $200,000 medical expenses if that was the amount and they will get it. But if you put the house into your living trust in the same hypo, they cannot request the reimbursement from your house because your house is not subject to probate. Also trust is not a public record unless you voluntarily record it at the recorder's office. It's your um, confidential information, privacy, uh, so you can keep the privacy. And again, trust is valid during your lifetime and after your uh, passing as well. So those are type of document we can, uh, we can think of. And this one is I co copied from Alabama County probate court website. And these are just showing timeline, the diagram. If you go to probate court for the city and the state, how complicated, how terrible. So if you're interested, you can go and look at this diagram, but just make sure if you, the reason to avoid probate is it takes a long time. It's really um, stressful and it requires a lot of energy. So um, we do, help out a lot of economic injustice or homeowner and foreclosure preventions. And, you, or, and our estate planning service is based on your income uh, sliding scale fee, which is could be from zero to $2,000, $2,700. So if you are interested in setting up your living trust and any other document, please feel free to contact, email us or call us and we will be able to provide more information in detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Young. Um, and next we'll have um, Sandra Gates Anderson present on behalf of Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development. Most of you I trust are here as part of the Mayor's program. So hopefully um, you'll be able to learn the next step in order to, um, 
to be able to put into a state your property. Thank, thank you, Matt, and thank you, A. Young. Um, Kristen, if you could uh, share a slide for me, that would be great. And I'm just gonna put the slide up. And um, so this is kind of the process. I'm gonna go over it and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process. But as um, Chris, um, our tech support put in the chat, we actually have a workshop coming up on the 11th. Um, and I believe it's a two hour workshop, so it'll go more into detail. So MoCD's trust approval process. So we do not put the trust together, but we do want to review the trust and make sure it meets our requirements. So what will happen is the attorney or the homeowner or both will prepare a draft trust and deed, complete the certification of trust authority and power. Um, then they're gonna submit the required documents to MoCD to review. And we're gonna review the submission and instruct the owner to execute the trust. Now we may instruct you to make some changes, which you could do with your um, attorney or you can do on your own. Um, once you know we've reviewed everything and we've had you execute the trust, you're gonna return those documents to our office, which would be your final documents on file with us. And as A. Young had explained earlier, those documents are not recorded at the assessor's office. So this is private. This is not something that's public. Um, but we're going to prepare a trust writer on your behalf, as well as an assignment and assumption agreement, which is taking the original documents that you signed with the city, and now they're going to be in the name of the trust, as A. Young was explaining earlier on how to hold title. Then you're going to execute and record the new grant deed, as well as the assignment and assumption in the trust writer. Now, depending on um, if you purchase your house recently uh, through the mayor's office of housing and you're in a BMR unit, you may already be in the 2018 manual. There are provisions in that manual for allowing you to put your house in a trust, but prior to that, there were no provisions. And so you would have to opt into the new manual and we have instructions and information that we're not gonna provide um, today. However, we do have that information and we can send it to you. Um, so before we go to the next slide, I kind of want to talk about, you know, what, what does getting a trust, what does that look like? So the homeowner must be in compliance with our program rules to be eligible for the title transfer living trust. It must comply with, and it must be governed by the laws of California. Homeowners must be named as the trustor, trustee, and primary beneficiary of the trust. There must be no unusual risk or impairment of the city's rights. Um, it must contain certain restriction language approved by MoCD, which is another reason why when you work with your attorney or if you put it together on your own, it needs to just be a draft of the trust because we want to make sure that it has the specific language that we're looking for. So what we give you is a trust transfer package and it has all the requirements in there. And A. Young and other nonprofit um, attorneys are familiar with our process. So, um, and the information is there. And if they have questions, they can contact us as well. The attorney can reach out to us or you can. The property um, has use and occupancy restrictions set by the city. And transferring the property to a new owner triggers the city's right of first refusal and option to purchase the property and other rights. Any changes to MoCD authorized trusts must be approved by MoCD before the changes can be made. So once we approve your trust, if you want to change it later, which, you know, as A. Young ex explained to you earlier, you can make changes while you're alive. You just need to let MoCD review those changes so that we can make sure that we agree with that. Um, so what are your first steps? The first step is to submit the title change request letter to MoCD, draft of your trust documents, which include the declaration of trust, or it could be the abstract of trust or your trust certificate, certification of trust authority and power, draft of the grant deed, which shows the proposed vesting on how you're going to now be holding title. Um, so what does that process look like? Um, so the attorney 
or the homeowner prepares the draft. Um, the trust is submitted to MoCD. MoCD reviews the submission and instructs the owner to execute the trust. Homeowner and or attorney finalizes the trust and homeowner executes the trust and returns it to MoCD. MoCD prepares the trust writer and assignment and assumption, which can then be executed. Um, so this is, that's really the process that we went over here. Um, Christian, if you could go to the next slide, if there's another one. So um, this is pretty much everything that I just went over. Um, the submission will be reviewed once we receive all the documents. We are inundated with requests and we really appreciate um, those of you that are here today that have already submitted packages to us and you know we just appreciate your patience we will get to them um, again this is something that is new for us we did not come out with our trust policy until the end of 2019 and we have lots of uh, files to review um, right now we're focusing um, on refinance and sales transactions um, because of COVID-19 everyone is either refinancing or selling. And so we want to make sure we take care of keeping people housed. However, we do understand that um, people want to avoid probate. And so I'm, I'm very appreciative that A. Young has, is here today to explain these um, things to you on how to avoid probate. So, but just know that, you know, MoCD will be reviewing packages. If there's any changes, we will work with you and your um, attorney to make sure you get those changes in and uh, get your trust documents finalized. Um, I can actually, so there was a question in the chat. Um, I'm not sure. One of the uh, attendees wrote that uh, they had applied for a trust, but then their attorney didn't want to work with MoCD. It's a process. Um, there is a application process that we require that um, homeowners uh, review the package with their attorney, they submit their documents, and then they have to wait for us to review them. Uh, fortunately, A. Young and some of our other partners are familiar with this process. Um, they, they, in fact, help us put our trust guidelines together. So we are appreciative of that. Um, I, there's another question. Uh, let's see, Tatiana says, I would like to learn information regarding inheritance of BMR for a child who lived in a BMR unit for a long time but was not on title. So there, is, there are provisions um, in the inclusionary manual that governs uh, each unit. So depending on when you purchased your property, um, there are provisions in your manual for how your heir can inherit your property. So um, that's something, and I can send you my contact information, Tatiana, and I can look up your property to kind of see what that is so that you can learn more on how your heir can inherit your property because that is something that they can apply for in the event of your um, death. However, as A. Young is explaining today, there are ways that you can already have your set of instructions made. And then the language that is in our manual that talks about heirs inheriting the property or being a qualified buyer can also be included in your trust. Great, thank you. Um, I think it might be a little overwhelming for everybody with all of the information that has been presented between the housing counseling agency, your attorney, the city. Um, what should the um, homeowners here do if they, as the next step, um, if they were to decide that this is something that they want to do, who should they see next? Well, if they are interested in setting up a, a, a living trust, they, they're going to want to either do it on their own or work with an attorney. We definitely recommend that they work with an attorney. Um, we have our title transfer trust policy, and it's not public. It's not on our website. Um, A. Young has it and some of the other partners. When people inquire, we will send them the package. So um, I believe you're going to give my contact information at the end. I know that you gave it at the beginning of the presentation. They can contact me. Again, I don't create trust, but I do review them to make sure that they meet most of these 
uh, guidelines. Um, however, you know, if you decide to work with an attorney, you can have your, um, I'm going to, I got sidetracked when I saw a message pop up, but I'll let someone else handle that so I can finish my statement. But what will happen is um, you will get the uh, Mosi D trust transfer package. You will review it and you want to review it. Um, you want to take your time and review it. You want to, you know, if you're going to do it alone, you know, the instructions are there. However, if you're going to work with an attorney, the instructions are there for them. Again, A. Young at Hera and some of the other uh, nonprofit um, law firms have worked with us. So they know what needs to be in the package, but it's also spelled out. So that's what they're going to do. They're not going to set it up. They're not going to finalize the trust. If some, um, you know, someone here, one, any of the participants already have a trust, that's okay. Although you may not have gotten it approved with MoCD, you definitely want to take the time to get it approved. So it's kind of like that situation where you do something and ask for permission later. So that's where you would be in this process. You would be wanting to get permission from MoCD to be able to, you know, have your property into a trust. Sandra, I think you're also good for the next question as well. Um, in the DALP manual, change in title can trigger full payment of DALP. Is that true for trust as well? So any changes to title when you have a MoCD assisted property, you have to get permission from MoCD. So um, we're not going to have you pay it back. However, if you're wanting to put your property in a trust, you need to follow the transfer to trust policy. And I see the person that sent it and I'm gonna send you my contact information so that you can email me and I can send you a copy of the transfer to trust policy. And just so I'm clear, any type of transfer to the title of your property that is different from when you took ownership, that has to we have to review that. We have to say, yes, we agree with that. Or no, we don't agree with that. So that would mean you can't do that. So, um, so you definitely want to make sure you follow all the rules that are spelled out in your manual, as well as if you're going to do the, the title transfer for the trust, it's not just about you know, setting up the trust, but making sure it meets most of these rules. I can't hear you, Matt, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to go ahead and type it into the chat or if you wanna raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can also um, ask your question that way as well. So we have another question just come in here. Um, I, I'm gonna actually let a young answer that question because we're not doing TOD, you know, it's TODDs actually, but we're not doing that. So A. Young, can you explain that? Sure, so question is where do you file for a TODD after TODD is established? Can you change the beneficiary's name? Can you nullify the TODD once the trust is set up to put the title of the home into the trust? So you, um, once you make a TODD, you need to record it where your property is. So if you have, a, if you're living in San Francisco, but you, if you have a property in uh, Oakland, you need to file the recorded TODD at the Alameda County Recorder's Office within 60 days of the signing. So if you decide to change the beneficiary, you have to um, revoke the previous one and file a new one. Some people say you can just file a new one and it will override, but I would suggest you actually have to put the same manner, revoke your previous one, and then file a new one. And then, so you have a second TOD deed in the, the recorder's office, but you decide to make a living trust. And so instead of leaving the house to the beneficiary listed on second TOD deed, you want it to leave to beneficiary through the trust. And then you have to revoke your second uh, TOD deed. So chain of title must show exactly first TOD deed, revocation of the first TOD deed, and then second TOD deed and revocation of second TOD deed. And then you set up a trust and put another deed to put 
your house into the trust. So it's a doable, but there will be a lot of procedure. So the downside of TOD deed is most of estate planning do not really uh, prefer it because a lot of people forget to do revocation officially. I hope I answered the question. And the next question, Matt, I'll take that one. And that was from Tatiana. Tatiana, I am sending you my contact information so that your question can be answered offline. It's gonna be specific to your property address, uh, the manual that governs your unit, um, et cetera. So rather than going a lot of personal detail on this chat, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, send you my contact information so that you can uh, offline send me an email and we can discuss. And then we would also recommend that you work with an attorney, you know, such as A. Young or any other uh, law firm to kind of put together an estate plan so that you can make sure that your heirs, you know, get your property once you pass away. So we'll talk offline on that. And just to add more on uh, what Sandra just said, and because if you meet an estate planning lawyer, you will see the estate planning lawyers offering drafting of the document. So at the end of the service, you will have an actual full document set. A lot of estate planning attorney sees the actual transfer of the home or a transfer, transfer of the other uh, primary asset into your trust. We call it trust funding. Trust funding is next step of the services. So drafting is one service and funding is another service. And I find, and I, we do serve, uh, serve, we do provide the service for funding only for the house as well, because the funding requires a lot of uh, transaction and communication with the different uh, folks. So make sure when you are meeting with a state planning attorney, you let them know up front and your house is subject to BMR. And then you know that uh, BMR has a special requirement and provide the information, the guidelines. So let the attorney clarify whether they will help the funding process or not. Thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And that's why you know, it's important to review the trust package to its entirety to make sure that, you know, that all the rules for CBD are being met um, and that your needs are being taken care of, your future needs, your needs that in the event of your death, what is going to happen? Um, there is another question in the chat about the 2018 manual. Does it supersede prior manuals? And no, it doesn't. So um, with MOCD, depending on the year that you purchased your unit, there's gonna be a manual specific to your unit. Um, and that's gonna be spelled out in your loan document. So what you wanna do is you wanna look, for example, if you purchased your property in 2009, our 2018 manual was not out. So what manual was out at that time? It's gonna be spelled out in your loan documents. However, um, if you're in a BMR unit and you were in one of the prior manuals that had no provision for putting the property in the trust, you're gonna opt into the new manual. And again, that's something that you and your attorney can look at, you know, is it beneficial for you to opt into the new manual? What are the differences between the 2018 manual and your current manual? So all of these things you need to be able to look at, and that's something that you can look at with them. Um, and again, there is a package that I have that kind of spells out what you need to do. So Sandra, I just want to underscore what you had just mentioned. It sounds like the promissory note is a very important document that spells out what it is that they can and cannot do and what other documents um, it's referring to as far as the conditions. So um, if you can elaborate on that or if I captured it, that would be great. Yeah, so their loan documents. So it's not just their promissory note, it's their promissory note, their deed of trust. People are putting um, comments in the chat about their manual, there is a manual that governs these BMR units. And so you need to be looking at all of those things when you're considering your estate planning. Um, some of the things that have come up in the chat were about passing the property on to a child. In your manual, there are provisions for passing the property on to a child. So a lot of these things are spelled out there. And so we just want to make sure 
that and you know and someone brought up about the doubt i'm glad that people are even looking at their manuals so you know there are things that you could do that would bring you out of compliance most of cd you know so changing the title of your property without permission is one of them however we want to help you we understand that you know avoiding probate we love the presentation that a young gave and she's showing you you know how to avoid probate you know if your asset is going to be over what was it, $162,000, which you already said that even the tiniest house is going to be worth more than that. So we want to make sure that we're able to assist you. So we are here to help, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we're following the rules that we've outlined. Okay, so um, can I, um, I think it's worthwhile to mention another one. Um, if time is allowed, may I? We definitely have time, so thank you. Yeah, so if you once we we'll make a living trust and sometimes, oftentimes we move around and we sell the house that we previously put into your living trust and you purchase another home in different area. And that's okay, you do not have to make the, your trust, whole trust again, because you're making this trust, which is a water bottle. So you're putting your house into this water bottle trust. You take it, took it out and sold it. Now you purchase a, another home. It looks like this pen. And then you need just need to put this one into your living trust, meaning you're not changing this whole trust bottle. You are just putting de your deeding second property into your living trust. So if you purchase, if you sold a prior house and purchase second one, no sweat, no need to make a new trust. Just make sure you deed properly. The second from a young Kim's name. Oh, I had a living trust. Remember this, my silver colored water bottle. Oh, I need to put that one into my water bottle trust. So make sure when you purchase second home, talk to your realtor saying, oh, I have a trust. I want to put that one into my trust. So hopefully that realtor can help you at the end of escrow. If not, that's okay. You just need to simply do another deed from a young Kim to a young Kim's living trust. And also typically if you made a trust, there will be some schedule a or some type of list of asset when i nowadays we put just all real property any real property but if you had to specify that your old home in san francisco now you have new home in san diego and just you need to simply update the schedule a showing removing the old house and put the second house so oftentimes you don't have to make a whole new trust as long as you keep the same beneficiary or same fiduciary changing assets just you just simply indicating you change the asset well thank you everyone um do we have any last question as we begin to finish up our hour Great, um, it was wonderful being able to spend this evening with you and to provide you with some information that's going to be very important part of protecting your asset. Um, and I also wanna thank A. Yang Kim from Hera for joining us tonight and providing her uh, legal expertise and Sandra Gates Anderson from the Mayor's Office of Housing and Community Development to give us the um, direction for what we will need to do if we own property and um, that is involved in the MoCD program. So thank you everyone for joining us here tonight. Um, hopefully you have our information that has been posted. I believe um, Kristen is putting that up. So if you have any follow-up question, um, feel free to reach out to us. Um, if you need help organizing that information, you can read, reach out to me as well, but I will um, help you put all of your thoughts together in order to get this um, to the right people. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.